missing. Jonathan Crompton joins us now. Jonathan, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Um, you have to say something really insightful and good because apparently we have gotten we've gotten targeted once again. <laughs> Bring on the, Crompton. Yeah, with all the um, fine love yeah. on the best dating website. Nice. Um, so yeah, there you go. I know you're happily married, but for those that aren't, they better click on those quickly if you're interested, because I'm going through and blocking them. So uh, I'm assuming that's a Braves hat, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I doesn't got have the mullet. No, I've, I've got every team's hat, and <laughs> I'm actually a Dodgers and an Orioles fan. Oh, nice. All right. So. Team's fun to root for. The others, not so much. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, all right. So, John, let's get into this. Um, Tennessee, Georgia, <clears throat> as as far as a player, what's going through your mind and how important is it to manage your emotions, um, John? Because the game is still, if you're watching this live, uh, 30 hours away, 32 yeah. hours away. How important is it to manage your emotions in a game this big? Um. I mean, obviously very crucial. The The good part is I think we've kind of harped on this before. This staff, I think, does a really good job of managing the players and the operations staff and just organization as a whole. So I think it's going to be very big. Um, I've been kind of vocal about it in the past. I don't think Sanford Stadium is a bad place to play, right? Um, I don't think it's the loudest – by far in the SEC. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily worried about that. We have obviously haven't been ranked number one in a long time. So I think that's kind of the thing that a lot of people are, are, that are involved inside the program have to get used to again. Right. We haven't had it in such a long time that we've got to be able to, like you said, control our emotions, um, make sure that everything's on our normal routine. The, you know, the bus to the airport, right. Guys do your same stuff. Don't get out of your routine. At Georgia, I'm assuming they do it the same as we did. We had to bus to Georgia. We didn't get to fly to Georgia because Athens Airport was so small. Um, oh, we I didn't fly, even know. We would fly home from Athens in two planes, but we would bus to Athens. So I don't know if they do it the same. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's just normal routine, another day as usual. So that's going to be the biggest thing to, to make sure is just don't do anything different than we have done all year because what we've done has obviously been working. All right, and don't make it bigger than it needs to be. It is funny you mentioned that about uh, Sanford Stadium. I don't know why that's become such a talking point. To me, it was just kind of common sense. And they have an open press box. So to give people an idea of, of, of what I have actually witnessed, Tennessee does not have an open press box. So I've, I've gone outside during some of the loudest times to listen and try to uh, compare. I don't think Georgia's in the top five of loudest no. stadiums, John. No, top five in the country, top five in the SEC. Uh, borderline top five in the SEC. Here's who I would have, and you tell me. LSU, Auburn, Florida, Tennessee, and then there's a little bit of a drop-off. Do you? I would, well, I would say, honestly, I would say we're one. Okay. Then LSU, depending on the year. And I wasn't going in any particular yeah, order. No, but, I'm just, but I'm just saying in general, like that's I'm going to go in order. I would go us, LSU, Auburn. Auburn is loud as hell. And I don't know. I mean, they don't hold the most, but they get loud. Yeah. Florida, but the reason why Florida is because they finally admitted that they do pump in noise and music, but still it's loud. And Alabama, right? Alabama does definitely get loud. Um, Georgia, I'm, they're not. And the, the Mississippi State almost gets louder than Georgia because of the goddamn cowbells. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, They're miserable. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I don't think, I don't think Georgia gets loud. I mean, I've been very honest about it in the past. I went on a recruiting visit there multiple times and I watched them play South Carolina and I fell asleep during the game. It's the only game that I've ever fallen asleep in. Now we had, a, it was a late night from the Friday night game, blah, 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 blah. But still, it just, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm not hesitant to say this. It kind of feels like they're the North Carolina or UNC of the SEC in the sense of the, wine and cheese type crowd. Um, and that is not trying to hate. That's just my opinion on it because they, they don't get overly aggressively loud. Um, 
they may now that they've been ranked number one for a few years, won the national championship last year, all this stuff. But it's never been a place to feel threatened to go play. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, and Amanda, j- jump in here. Um, I, 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 to to me, as far as this offense, I don't think even if it is one of the loudest places, they've been to LSU this year, but they were all hung over at the time. I, I don't, I don't think with this offense they get that affected because they have to deal with noise at home. There were times that Josh Heupel, you know, said, "Be quiet, be quiet." And a, a lot of it's nonverbal communication, John. If you can kind of speak to that and how helpful that is, you think, for Tennessee on the road, whether or not it's loud. Yeah, well, if you notice, most teams go to – or we, what we used to do is we'd, it's called silent cadence. We'd lift our leg on the road. Guard would look over, tap the center. Center would do a little head bob or finger point and snap the ball, kind of like Florida did against us. We'd do a clap. So even at home, we'd do a clap, so it's all there's never a verbal cadence. Right. I'll take that back. The only time it's verbal is when we go under center the one time a game. Um, so the receivers are all they're signaled. They're looking at which three or which one of the three coaches that are signaling is live, and they're getting their said formation and said route. The only verbal communication that has to be done is Hendon tell the line the play. And he, he walks up there, says the play, gets back in the shotgun, makes everybody set and goes. But the beauty of an offense like this is it's just one word. It's not like we used to do and we were having to tell them a lot of different stuff, right? Or if we were audibling a play, have to go all the way down the line, blah, 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 and tell them the protection or the run game. Um, So I I don't think that the crowd noise is that big of a factor because it's such little verbiage being done. Let me ask a a quick follow-up on that, Amanda, if you don't mind. Okay, so why is it just one word as opposed to rattling off a – okay? Go ahead. I, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, I'm going quick. That That's why. It's just everything is – Um. so in the – I'm going to call them the older offenses. When you had a two-minute drill, you would have said formation, said protection, said play as one word, and you just call it and go. And it never changed, right? In an offense like this, you lump all this stuff together to where – Everybody knows one word that's that route and that route combined, right? Both sides. The protection is automatically built in, stuff like that. So everything can be done quicker. When we're trying to average 60, 75, 85 plays a game, which is kind of absurd to think, but that's the mindset. We want to average that many plays. Um, you got you to go quick. You got to have one word. So it's essentially a, a guaranteed nonstop two-minute offense, which everything is so short and sweet, but everything changes. But it's all compartmentalized into to one, like, phrase. I know that we talked about, and we always typically talk about, because I, I love picking your brain as a, you know, as a former quarterback in this league and playing against all these uh, these teams. Now, and I'll say the only time Georgia fans are, they do get loud is outside of the stadium when they bark at you. I'm just saying that's the most obnoxious thing I've ever seen. Stop barking at people for the love of God. If you're a Georgia fan, you're a grown man. Yes, you are a grown grown man. man. Barking like a dog. Now, one of my dogs is sitting right here. I don't go bark at her. Yeah. So, no, (laughs) exactly. Stop barking. So, anywho, um, this quarterback competition between Stetson Bennett and Hendon Hooker. Again, I've already said that I don't think Stetson Bennett's that great, but can you weigh in on what he brings to the table and and how they're they're different or who's better? It's hard to say who's better because they run totally different systems. Totally different, right? Um, I have noticed, and I'm trying to think how to say this where it, and explain it from my head because I know what I'm trying to get out. If you look at last year, there's always – since Stetson's been there until this year, there's always been that other dude right right there. Mm. He was never the guy from week one. He had to come in, so he always had to prove himself. This year, if you notice, there's been a few more – now, obviously, they're undefeated. Obviously, they're a really, really, really good team, if not a great team. 
But there's been some weeks that you go, your play is not nearly what it was last year and the year before when you came in and played sparingly because you had that guy pushing you. Now it's like, and, hey, we got to play Missouri in a few weeks. We may have a letdown against Missouri. We don't know. We got to play the game. But for to be as supposed to be uh, being as dominant as Georgia is, there should never have been that close against Missouri, right? Kent State should not have been as close as, what, 29 points or something like that early when you're going, you're supposed to beat them by 60. You're the number one team in the country. So it kind of feels like there's not necessarily, because I don't know the guy, but it almost feels like he's got that level of I'm untouchable now that it may get to him sometimes. Hendon, you can tell, is just, I mean, this is what I do. I've always been the underdog. Yes, I've started at Virginia Tech. I was counted out, blah, blah, blah. And he has that mindset. So it's Stetson, but you can tell something's changed this year. Interesting. Like, it just, when you watch his play, now, dude's athletic as hell. He is. I've been honest about, I think, the biggest matchup this week is their tight ends versus our linebackers or nickel DBs. They, they got that advantage, which is what it is. They're stupid athletic, bigger and faster than our linebackers, which for any offense is an advantage. So that's a great matchup to watch. But with, with Stetson, I think you I think we can rattle him easier than Hendon gets rattled. Look at – and I'll, I'll go back to this a lot. Look at Bryce Young. We played him. He got the snot beat out of him. He was getting up, dusting himself off, smiling at his O-line, patting him on the back, right? Go look at um, the Florida game when Hendon's just sitting there doing this, holding himself, looking at those online going thumbs up like we're good instead of making it about me. And I don't, once again, don't know the guy, but it feels like this year things have been made about Stetson rather than University of Georgia offensive football. Hendon doesn't do that. That's where I think we set ourselves apart. And that's obviously I'm, I'm going to, I think we're going to win obviously, but that's why I kind of think we win because our guys really, really, really buy into the personality of Hendon, which is a lot bigger than people think when it comes to football at the quarterback position. Yeah, you got to be able to throw the ball. You got to be able to make reads, but they got to take on your personality. They've got to trust that you're not gonna that you're not gonna cave. That essentially the old cliche that you you've got to die on the field with them. Hendon, you can tell they feel that way. I don't know if they feel that way about Stetson. I really don't. It just doesn't seem the same as last year. It's interesting, and one of the things that you you can say is that the recruiting's been such an incredible level that you, you can say from team to team, even those teams that have returning starters. But Jonathan, I think you can speak to this as well as anybody. Team chemistry and that sort of thing changes year to year. They were oh, yeah. incredibly driven. I mean, they are two really different teams at, at any team from two years. People like to say, oh, they've got 20 returning yeah. stars, which Georgia doesn't. But they, they say they've got all these restar- the returning stars, the same team. No, team chemistry can change and does change year to oh, year, yeah. every year, right? Well, yeah, well, because you have whoever's leaving, graduating or leaving for the draft, and a whole new class coming in. And that's where as soon as you – I mean, you can always say it in high school and in, in middle school and everything, but in football specifically, every year – the la- like my the team that I, I coached for in high school, we were in the playoffs tonight. Right? First oh, round of the playoffs. Good luck. Well, I appreciate that. The the, <laughs> and the thing is the guys gotta realize is one, don't make it then it don't make it bigger than it needs to be. But this is the last guaranteed game with where this team will be together. Next year it's an automatically new team. Seniors are leaving, freshmen will be coming in, guys from JV will be coming up to varsity, blah, 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 right? That's how it works, especially in college. You're gonna you don't know what Redshirt sophomores or juniors are going to leave for the draft, right? Look at Georgia. They had, what, seven seven guys on defense drafted? That That's a pretty big chunk. So the chemistry has to be done. You know, you say, oh, well, they were on the team last year. Doesn't matter. They weren't starting. You don't know how they're going to react in adverse situations. So the chemistry, I think, every year it does change. But more so, they take on the personality of your leaders. And your quarterback, regardless of if you want to be, is a leader. So I tell everybody I work with when I train them. 
regardless of whether you like it or not, everybody in that huddle looks at you and goes, we're going as you go. That's simple because that's what you're taught in football. On defense, you're going as your middle linebacker or your free safety goes. Just what it is. They're the leader of that defense. So, that, that once again, that's why I give us the edge is I think that Hendon's personality has really kind of rubbed off on the team of no matter the situation we're in, we're okay. Regardless of the outcome, we're okay. Because this one game does not define how great of a season this has been so far. I think um, I was looking back at Georgia and their schedule, and they only beat Kent State, Kent State by 17 and this this season, which I think was a big red flag for a lot of people, 39-22, and I think it was kind of the end was where Georgia pulled away. This uh, Georgia-Florida game last weekend, I don't know if you had a – a chance to to see it um but yeah it was way closer than the score predicted and florida beat themselves pretty much missouri did the same thing beat themselves Mm -hmm. i see you know everyone says georgia so good so good so good i don't see it i i I just don't see it is it because they're not playing as a team or is it is a lack of talent what what is what makes georgia what they are right now why are they not better it's not a lack of talent that's for sure Right. They are very, very like uber talented. Once again, their tight ends, I think it's either three or four. Now they're not they're not all eligible for the draft, but if they were, it's either three or four tight ends that are in the top 40 <laughs> draftable players. Yeah. I mean, they're they are very talented. But, and that is a big but. So again, I go back to you take on the personality of your leaders, aka your quarterback. JT Daniels. Is a he's a really good quarterback. Wish he would have went to West Virginia. That's a side note, All right? But when you watch him at Georgia, you're like, you're winning. You're you're playing well. You're not making mistakes, right? Stetson comes in and understands. Oh, I cannot mess up. I've got to be right here. Well, now who who's behind him now? A freshman that is not going to take his job right this second. See, that's what I'm getting at. So that's where. It's almost like the, oh, we know we're better than this team. We're going to screw around for a little bit. And then we'll just make a run at the end. That Missouri game should not even been close. No. Missouri should have ran away with it. That's the sad part. Right? Missouri just doesn't have enough dudes to finish that game off yet. And if you're the number one team at the moment, or when that happened, the Kent State should not have been as close as it should have. Missouri should have been a freaking blowout. Right? Yes, every game in the SEC is hard. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, it's football. Every game's hard. It's football. You're taking two grown adults and saying, let's go physically hurt each other. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's always going to be hard. So when Kirby says, oh, every game in the SEC is hard, blah, blah, blah. Well, what happened to uh, what happened with Vandy? 55 to nothing. Vandy's just as bad as Missouri. That means you had a letdown. To be the number one team, you don't have letdowns. So I, I really think that it goes off of internal locker room and it started with the quarterback. I'm, I'm not – I think Stetson's a great athlete. I think, he throw, I think he throws a pretty ball. I don't think he's a guy that you go, hey, man, we got a minute 45 to go. We got no timeouts. We, we just blew him getting you the ball back, and we're down by four. We got 93 yards to go. Go win me this ball game. I don't think he's that dude. No, I mean, I there's, definitely- nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. I just don't think he's that guy. Bryce Young, yeah, he's that dude. You know what I mean? He's that guy. He's already – he's proven that time and time again. He's that – look at Texas this year. Hendon, I think he can be that guy. The guys believe he can be that guy. I don't think George is that team because they got to go run, 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 play action. And I think they know that now. Speaking of the Alabama-Georgia comparison, let me ask you this. And and I don't know how much you're able to see because it's always better to be at the game to to see secondary coverage but (coughs) or or game tape uh, afterwards, the All-22. But – when, when you look at Georgia and Alabama and the back end, their secondary, how would you compare the two? That's a really good question. Um, I think Bama's secondary is better now than it was when we played them. Um, what's that kid's name? Eli Ricks. Seven. He transferred from LSU. Eli Ricks. There it is. I think he's a damn good player. I do. Yeah. Um, I'm – I'm glad he wasn't playing, throwing that out there, right? 
I think because I think he makes them a lot better. Um, I do think that we exposed their star or you know dime DB uh, branch number fourteen, and so Georgia. Let's call it is everybody. We understand. Kirby and Saban have been on the phone. Hey, what should I do here? Blah 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 blah. They're buddies. They've coached together before. So Georgia does have that that up that they're going to get inside tips from Saban because Saban does he does not want to play us again in Atlanta. He would rather play Georgia because he knows it's a normal offense and he can compete with that. And so he he's going to do everything he can to help if possible. So with that being the case, Georgia's secondary I think has the advantage now because they're going to have inside tips. But I think they're very similar as far as players because they recruit the exact same type of player. Taller DBs, right? When I say taller, I don't mean 6'4", but taller than the average 5'8 DB, right? Back in the day, it was you were a corner 5'8", 5'9", and that was tall. Now you're looking 5'11", 6 foot, stuff like that. Really rangy guys. So I think they're very, very similar. They run a very similar type defense. They coach together for a while. So that helps us as well. But I just don't – they've lost so much on defense, I don't think that they can match our schematics. That's the big thing. They have to play so fast. Nobody in the SEC, on our schedule at least, is going to play our pace, right? The beauty is we got Tillman back. Yes, he had a he had a breakout game last year against them. Hyatt, obviously, he's tied and or broke the single – Touchdown, uh, single season touchdown record by a receiver. Mm-hmm. You got Brew McCoy. You got Keaton. You got Squirrel. Then you got our, our three tailbacks. I don't think they're going to face that many people that are going to run track meet routes all day. So no. that's, where, that's what helps us. As far as defensive secondary, they're very similar. They recruit the same guys. You're going to get a lot of the same, what I call bluff coverages, showing one, showing one coverage, bluffing it, and trying to get to that coverage to the other side. But the thing about our system is that doesn't matter. We read the same thing no matter what. So I don't think that they have an advantage on defense against us. I really don't. The advantage of the game is their tight ends on who we're going to have covering them. Uh, you want to take part in today's tough question, Jonathan? How about Let's that? I, I've Let's got one it. for you. All right. Today's tough question today is brought to you by Pedigo Chattanooga. Pedigo Chattanooga is – Family owned and uh, unique to Chattanooga and Pedigo is unique to the e-bike market in that they're able to do service work on your e-bike. So don't buy one just off e-commerce. Go Pedigo Chattanooga. It's a great place if you want to rent to uh, tool around downtown and have a fantastic time. But you'll want to buy one. It's fantastic to keep up with the young ones. That's Pedigo of Chattanooga. It is time for today's tough question. We do our research. Have you done your research? We're working like heck. Today's tough question. What's the real debate? You sipping my soup, eh, Guadalupe? Exclusively on Off the Hook Sports with Dave Hooker and Amanda LaFrada. You drinking my sake, Kimosabi? Oh, my God. And with Jonathan Crompton today. So, other than Hendon Hooker, who will be the MVP? Of the game tomorrow. You cannot pick Hendon Hooker. Who will be the MVP? Cool. Jonathan, you go first. Brew McCoy. Wow. That is weird. Because I was going to go a little off script too. Okay. Uh, I like Brew. I like what he does. I like what he brings to the table. No, we're not going to sit here and say, hey, you got Jalen Hyatt routes. You don't have to. Jalen can be a track guy, right? Yep. To me, yes, we need Tillman to play well, obviously, because when Tillman's over here and Hyatt can go both sides, but when they're over here, Brew's over here and all eyes are over there, right? So he needs to be able to hit the 15, you know, 15 yard digs, the what I call a bang eight, an eight yard post, his, you know, the wheel route stops and be effective with them. And the thing is, if you notice, he's got like, 500 yards receiving or something this year. And it's been a very quiet yeah. everybody else. So when you have guys like that, that can really bring up the level and go, Oh, they get all the attention. Hey, this ain't no slouch over there. He's into the boundary. Most of the time he's by himself. Let's get him. You know, so I, I really think he, 
I think he could definitely change the game and especially put it away late with big catches. All right, so let's get your thought on the message board. We have a couple of posts from Nico Slaughter, Cooper Mays. I would love that, but I don't know how you do that as a center, become the MVP. We better get like 42 pancake blocks. <laughs> <laughs> and we, be, we better run for 360, and they all better be in the A-gap behind the center. Yeah, he's got to be like that guy in the the bad guy in the Avengers movie, just destroying just, people. Honestly, literally just get out of here. <laughs> Ramel I Keaton. love it. Ramel Keaton gets a vote as the dark yeah, horse. See, I like that. And I was going to go along the lines of what Jonathan said, but I wasn't going to go Brew McCoy. But uh, let me go with Amanda first. So other than Hendon Hooker and now Brew McCoy, who is going to be the MVP in tomorrow's game? Jabari Small. I like that one. I like that one. All right. Yeah, so I would like I'm to going with. Jabari Small, I'd like to round it out because I was going to go with another receiver. I was going to go Cedric Tillman. I think he'll be 100%. He was on a snap count last week. And I do think people will be more mindful of Jalen Hyatt. Uh, How could you not be? Jabari Small was one I thought about this morning as well. Um, And then let's – the other one that I want to put in there is Byron Young. Because, goodness gracious, how can you not love his story? The guy was managing a Dollar General four and a half years ago, Jonathan. But the question is, yes, for the Dollar General part, was he managing the one that was like a quarter mile down the road every day? Because they they seem like they're just a point, you know, 0.25 miles apart everywhere you go. Or was right. he at the same store? Or do they say, hey, man, you're, you're a mile down the road on the, the fourth store, right? Yeah. At yeah, least, we, I swear they just pop up everywhere around here now. They do. We we could make the story better. He turned down a regional manager job, overseeing eighteen dollar uh, dollar generals, so that he could go to Georgia Community College and then to Tennessee. And he turned That's down awesome. that that lucrative regional manager job at Dollar General. You don't know. It could have been real. They could have paid really nice money. It no, could, no. I did read something about Dollar General House. He's had to make a few more a few more dollars an hour than that next year. <laughs> yeah, I, think about, I think he's about to do pretty well. I, I love that story, and it's one that because of Hooker and Hyatt and all the stories on offense gets overlooked. But uh, Jonathan, you you have to love that story. So we're going to go with Jabari Small. We're going to go with Byron Young and uh, Brew McCoy and uh, Cedric Tillman. If it is Jabari Small, John, then you would say that he had a big game running the football. Is it necessarily bad if Tennessee relies more on the running game than the passing game tomorrow? No, I've been very vocal. Um, so far, knock on, but everyone knock on, I've been um, undefeated in the sense. When we rush for 150 yards plus, we're, we win the game because that means we're playing ball control with how we want to play it. I hope that well, I, I want that streak to continue tomorrow. Obviously, the, and the closer we get to 200 yards rushing, the better our chances are, right? So I love that play with how we are, with how we play offense because we're we're a big home run threat that way, throwing it. But then we control the ball and get into those advantageous down and distances by running the ball effectively and staying in third and three, second and five, second and six to where we can go for it on fourth if we need to. Um, so I, no, I love that pick about small. John, it's funny you say that. There was a stat in the 90s when you were a younger man, and I was a younger man for that matter. But Steve Spurrier, when he rushed for – when his teams rushed for over 100 yards, they were something like a crazy 36-0. Yeah. and 0. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And, and we've rushed for over 150 yards every game this year. And that's the thing is – when we get to, and it's funny because on the halftime show, people throw on there and comment to me, hey, we're X yards away from it now. Because I just, for whatever reason, that's kind of that sweet spot for our offense is if we get to 150 on average, we're really hard to beat because now we can take our shots and that opens up our pass game. It keeps the safeties a little lower, makes the linebackers step up a little bit. So anything we throw, you know, 15, 10 to 15, 12 yards, somewhere in there is more open with width because the backers have to step up. That's why we can't rely only on the pass. Um, and that's, you know, but that's also, technically speaking, if we wanted to say a dark dark horse, we could have said a, a group and said the whole O-line, because they have the hardest job of 
giving us protection off of the play actions to go deep because it doesn't happen with just, it's not a quick throw. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of fun stuff to be looking for uh, tomorrow. Yeah, I'll offer another one. How about Jalen Wright? Yeah. Um, and here's why I say that. I think we all like Jabari Small, and there's there's you should. But I'll be honest with you, as far as just a natural runner, I think he's got a little wiggle that maybe Jabari Small doesn't have, John. Well, I'll well, tell you who's got some wiggle is Samson. Oh, yeah. But he's our number three, right? Now, depending on what happens. Now, the thing that with Small that gets me is just make sure that he's he's protected in the shoulder because you can tell he's wearing that sully brace. Just make sure he stays healthy. Now, obviously, he's not going to feel it during the game unless something bad happens. But if, if something were to happen and he he's out, then don't be surprised if we start using Samson a lot more for the speed game. Hmm. All right. I could see that. All right. Well, Jonathan, final uh, prediction. Uh, how does this game shake out? Give me a thumbnail sketch of what we're going to see in Samford Stadium tomorrow. Very quiet Samford Stadium. I, I think early, truly, I think early, we uh, it's kind of back and forth. But then I really do. I think in the second half, I think we're going to not necessarily run away with it, but run away with it for the SEC. Not as bad as LSU, obviously. But I'm going to I'm going to take us 42 to 30. 42 to 30. Great stuff, John. Uh, enjoy the weekend. Good luck tonight, man. Who you guys got? And what are the key matchups there? Don't give anything away. Well, it's we're the number two seed in the state. Um, we're playing the number 31 seed, but they're not a number 31 seed. Their head coach was suspended early in the year for some whatever reasons for seven games, and they went one and six. That sounds they're, sounds really salacious, but anyway, they, go ahead. <laughs> he, they're, they're a really, really good team. They're not a three and seven ball, ball club is what I'm getting at. Um, so tonight we got to make sure that we, we don't have a letdown thinking they're three and seven. So that's, you know, that's on us coaches to do that. And, um, no, we're playing really well. I mean, we got to do the little things, throw and catch, run and block like we normally do. We're averaging 45 to 46 points a game. So we need to average that again tonight to be safe. You know, just, you never know. They've got a tailback that runs about a four or five flat that can just move. Um, a couple big tight ends, so our defense has got their their hands full. But offensively, we've got to we've got to do what we've done all year and and schematically mess them up with formations, which I I like doing that. Right? It's yeah. that, that, that's the fun part. So I'm in the box, and it's it's really fun watching them. I, I script the first ten plays to see how you're going to line up to certain formations, and then go from there. Um, it's Have very fun. fun to say that. It's very fun. Have fun. Good luck. I'm I curious as to what that coach did. Is it recruiting or salacious? Like I think it was like recruiting or something. Okay. You can't, and I don't think it was actually – I think the state is the one that did it just to try to prove a point. I don't think it was anything bad. I really okay. don't because it was a, something with a crosstown rival that was like a new school that took some kids from his school because of where they live. Oh, okay. And, you know, it, wasn't, mean, it, it wasn't like a Mike Price situation. No, no, no. no. Okay. It, 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 but it wasn't even like, oh, hey, you need to come here. We'll get your parents a uh, job type deal, from my understanding. So, you know, you never want to see that happen. I feel bad for that coach. But that they I mean, they are a good team. If they're – if we don't do what we're supposed to do and, and they somehow beat us, they're a, a team that nobody wants to play thinking they're a 31 seed because they're – if he's there all year, they're probably a top five seed, top six. Last I heard, it was uh, you guys were favored by six and a half, and I did I did take you guys against the spread. So oh, good luck, that. man. I appreciate that. John. No, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> I do. I well, do. I, you know, it's cool. Like, one of our centers' uh, mom got all the players and coaches a shirt, so it's got our conference championship, and then it's, they put tombstones for all the teams with the scores. It's actually kind of funny. Nice. I do have a buddy who has a bit of a gambling problem and they were playing golf one time and nice. they said, what can we gamble on? And uh, this guy, the guy in their golf group said, oh, well, my nephews play in middle school basketball and they went and they gambled <laughs> on middle school basketball, sat in the stands and gambled on middle school basketball. I would. When, when point, was this? It's either going to be really good. Or we got it. We got to admit we got a problem. 
you know what I'm saying? Like, we're way past that point. Oh, we're way past it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That I mean, when you're betting on middle school football or basketball or whatever you just said, we are way past the point of admitting we have a problem. I'm just waiting to hear the story of somebody saying, Hey, little Johnny's T ball team, he didn't go three for four. Where's my money? Right. I mean, anything I what have. bookie takes that. Uh, no, well, they they were just well. betting amongst themselves. There wasn't a fan duel involved. Well, I know, but it would be funny if a bookie just went to like different like middle school games and was like, I got these are the odds I got for this. You, team you red. technically speaking, you could get that going in your own hometown and be like, hey, by the way, I've got I'm taking this conference all year. We got spreads and we got over unders. Who's in? Yeah, I'm not saying I would, I'm not, I wouldn't do it, but somebody there's call, somebody's going to do that at some point. Yeah, probably if they already have it. It's a side gig. Jonathan, great stuff. We'll talk to you soon. I appreciate you. Thank you. Jonathan Crompton.